Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I say good evening from Scotland. Um, it's good morning to many of you as well. But um, good evening and a very happy World Auto Day to you all. Um, thank you for joining us. For those that are returning following this morning session, welcome back. And I hope you enjoyed the series of presentations we had this morning from a number of auto experts and enthusiasts. And for those that are joining again today, uh, sorry, joining for the first time today, I wish you again a very happy World Auto Day. Whatever time you are in your World Auto Day, we'll hope you have a great day. It is with great pleasure and delight that we invite you today for today's second part of the webinar sessions that we're hosting. Um, as many of you will know, we have two sessions, one kind of to cover um, the different time zones and so that nobody misses out. So our earlier session had a focus on Eurasian and European and Asian species, um, whereas this afternoon or evening session is kind of based more around the Americas and African otters. We are absolutely delighted to be joined by six different individuals working on different species across the world, uh, and we'll be hosting five presentations throughout that. Um, obviously, within the presentations, there are two individuals for um, one of them, which I will explain a little bit more further down the line. Just a bit of housekeeping and to keep things nice and simple before we start the presentations, um, each presenter will have a presentation on their respective work, and then from there, they will be able to answer any questions. Once the um, presentations are complete, you will have the opportunity to ask any questions in both the Q&A or the chat boxes, and I will then ask each presenter um, to answer those questions for you. If you have any questions during the presentations, feel free to pop them in the box while they're in your head, and we can ask them at the end to the presenters. Um, like I say, at the end of all the presentations, we will have an open Q&A, sorry, at the end, once everyone's presented, the time that we have remaining, we will have an open questions and answers for any questions and for all panelists, for any questions that you might have for panelists earlier in the day or earlier in the webinar that you want to ask that you may have forgotten or didn't have. Um, if you have any questions that you want to direct to any of the presenters in that period, then please, if you can, put their name down. Otherwise, I will try and work out who you want to aim for. We are delighted today to have attendees and registrants from over 40 different countries across the two, we two webinars and have over 200 people registered to join us. Many of you will know why IOSF launched World Auto Day, but just to give you a bit of background, we launched it to raise awareness and much needed support for conservation of otters across the world. Each year, there are events held in every continent, bar Antarctica, to kind of emphasize the importance of otters, how amazing they are as a species, and to draw attention to the conservation and the threats that they are facing. This year, we have at last count 39 different countries holding events in many different areas and all focused on different aspects such as research, education for children or communities, and also are all drawn to raising awareness of otters and their conservation in their respective areas or globally. For this afternoon or evening's presentation, we are delighted to be joined by a number of otter experts from their particular regions. We will be offered the following presentations by the following individuals. Um, we have Adriana Belen Vallejos, who will talk about the distribution of neotropical otters and the climate crisis, a study case in Northern Argentina. We have Javier Trevelli and Valentina Diaz Savaria, who have produced a video on the amazing work of Chinchimin in Chile and Javier himself called Changungo Reottering Chile. We have Heather Barrett of CRR Savvy and her presentation on being CRR Savvy. We have Ana Maria Montes Ferro on the giant otter conservation and community involvement. And we have Claire Taylor of the Two Oceans Aquarium in Cape Town, South Africa, who will be giving an introduction into urbanized African clawless or Cape clawless otters in the city. 
for any of you that were aware of the kind of the program beforehand, unfortunately, due to um, things out with their control, Dr. Nicola Oakes couldn't join us, but thankfully Claire has kindly offered to step in and we are so delighted for that. We are delighted, as I've said many times, to welcome you all to the World Art Day webinar. Once again, thank you for joining and sharing your time and knowledge with IOSF, with myself and all the attendants here today. So without further ado, and you don't want to listen to my voice for too much longer, we will pass you over to our first presentation. Like I said, if you have any questions um, during the presentation or at the end of the presentation, use the Q&A or the chat box and I'll be sure to ask them at the end. So we'll pass over to Claire Taylor and I'll give a brief bio of Claire and her work and, and then I'll let her produce her presentation. So Claire is the dry, exhibits and marine animal welfare specialist. She has worked at the Two Oceans Aquarium in Cape Town, South Africa for 23 years, starting as a volunteer and progressed up the ranks to curator of the exhibits. Claire helped start sea, uh, Seal Disentanglement Programme in 2007 and Marine Animal Welfare is where her heart is. She forms part of the Marine Wildlife Management Programme that the VNA Waterfront and Aquarium started five years ago. Birds, seals and sunfish have been their main focus, but four Cape Claws otters are currently proving to be their greatest challenge yet. I'll hand you over to Claire and thank you, Claire. Cool, hi there, Ben, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. So if you can go ahead and okay. share your screen, that'd be great. Hi there. <laughs> yeah. um, there we go. Okay. Yeah, that's perfect. We can see that. Thanks. Okay, cool. Hi, everybody. Um, sorry, I've got very big uh, shoes to fill um, with Nicola Oaks, um, who unfortunately can't be here. Um, I'm no utter expert. I've actually just um, very recently uh, suddenly this has kind of fallen in our laps. Um, as as uh, Ben said earlier, it's other animals that we deal with, mainly with seals actually. Um, and now suddenly we have um, four, yeah, Cape Clawless otters that are causing quite a bit of havoc in the waterfront. So just to give you some idea um, of where I'm talking about, this is, uh, this is Cape Town, South Africa. Um, and pre-COVID, you're looking at about 200 million visitors annually. Um, and we're actually getting up to, I think, quite close to those numbers again now that the world's returning to normal. You can see on the side there, a little red dot, that is um, the Two Oceans Aquarium. So we are situated, I'm going to try and just, I learned how to do the pointer thing earlier from one of your presenters. Okay, so that's where the aquarium is. And you can see we're situated in a highly urban area. Um, this over here is all retail, very expensive shopping center, um, some of the most expensive hotels um, in Southern Africa, just about over here, and one right next to the aquarium, which is the one I'm going to focus on now. Um, a marina here, again, very expensive clientele, all the way down to your working harbor, which is all this section here. Um, so you really do have a mixture of of people. Again, I'm just going to zoom in a bit from the area, from aerial view. This is the area I'm going to be talking about if my laser point is working. Um, again, you can see how built up it is. There are two other families um, that I have, have come to learn about now in the last six months of um, Cape Clawless living on this section here, which I'm very interested to find out how that fits into our bunch. And then a rogue male who's hanging out over here, who's bitten numerous people, and this has actually turned quite nasty and aggressive over here. So that's what we don't want to get to. Okay, so I'm going to zoom in here. Okay, so this is where the aquarium is, <clears throat> and this is a canal system that sits, sits yeah, at the back here and goes all the way down into an actual town. This is the one and only hotel, which... Um, yeah, is I think a six-star hotel, and 
as you can see, just got to click on here. This is the kind of vegetation that they've gone and created. So very beautiful um, for their clientele and actually absolutely perfect for, for Cape Claudus otters. Got a lot of sand, you've got a lot of foliage, and of course um, the water you're looking at there is, is salt water teeming with life, um, teeming with fish, crabs, little sharks, and then freshwater fountains all over the place. So this here is Wizard. He, um, well, we think this is Wizard. <laughs> um, he's been around since about 2015, and we used to get um, a call calls for him causing a bit of trouble around restaurants, uh, probably about just October, November, December. Um, obviously, the waterfronts, uh, it's our huge season uh, for tourists around December. So he was well noticed. He'd run through hotel swimming pools. Um, but we would just be able to, it would only really be at night, and we were able just to tell people um, it's just a few months, you know, not a few months, it's like a couple of weeks, you just got to hold on, and then he's going to disappear again. So this year, when he started to show, show up in um, probably October last year, he, we said, don't worry, just hold your breath. He's going to be gone like he always is. This time, it wasn't the case. <laughs> so if this works here, yeah, the red dot at the bottom of the screen, that's a hotel. And that's one of the hotels that he used to frequent. But again, it was, it was rarely. And um, what would happen is he actually learned how to get through sliding doors into the swimming pool, but the hotel staff learned how to manage it. They would tell everyone to get out of the swimming pool, um, just stand back, um, take your cell phones out, you're about to see a Cape Claudus otter, and um, they kind of turned it into a positive experience. He would have a quick swim and then he'd be gone. And as I said, this would happen for a couple of weeks and then that's it. But this year, not the case. So these are all the freshwater pools. You'll see the red dots coming up, all the Okay, so that's a residence area where people live, freshwater swimming pools all the way along there. Um, that's the big hotel swimming pool, which was actually the cause of this massive issue um, that started in December. Those again, resident pools along the side there. And then the yellow are freshwater fountains. So right next to the aquarium, again, at the right at the deck um, of the hotel's restaurant, main restaurant, and fountains that are on the on the actual, um, on an island there. So we were pretty much called in December by a very ag angry hotel that said, you have 48 hours to make these otters disappear. Um, and first of all, they're not our otters, they fall under government. Um, and no one's going to make any otters just disappear. So um, it's been six months of trying to calm everybody down and explain the situation. Also explaining the fact that if these otters were to just evaporate somehow that you're just creating a void for your neighboring otters to move in because they've created such a perfect environment um, and actually having all your experts like Nicola have have you know told us that it's better to have a family a family of otters that um, will keep all your other males out and rather deal with them so it's taken a long time to calm everybody down um, why am I not moving? Okay, so we went from Wizard, the first otter, to his little family. So now when he, when he arrived in December, he arrived with two females, we think. And um, there have been three, there have been three, there have been three, and then a couple of weeks ago we counted four. Um, and this is in one of the hotel, one of the hotel fountains. Um, the problem, so I mean, I, yeah, most people are like, well, What's the problem? You know, that's absolutely amazing that you have them right there. People are able to to view a species that you wouldn't, nail, you know, really see otherwise because they're supposed to only come out in the evenings. These guys are out all day long. So the problem is, is that that's a big problem. So that's how close they're getting. That's me on a kayak um, and happily coming up to people on kayaks, up on sup boards, swimmers. And if you don't know how to deal with them in terms of just moving out of their way, they get more and more brave and then end up biting. So, so far we've had very minimal bites. Um, it's a tricky one because you don't want to say um, to people, oh my gosh, you know, they can rip your calf muscle off you because, <laughs> but you also got to tell people like the little scratch you got on your, on your toe is really, it's, it's an inquisitive or just a small territory nip and, um, and yeah, 
you really don't need to worry about that. So it's been a lot of changing the narration. When I got back in, in January, it was a case of otters are attacking and otters are biting. And it's been changing the attack to actually just um, changing that word to just being inquisitive, trying to move you off and biting to just it's a nip. It's not not hectic. You can see there. So this was me. Unfortunately, me is fine in the water, but that's what he's that's what the otters are doing. They're getting that close to people who don't know anything about otters and because most of the people out there are actually, um, they kind of do know how to be around animals. They go quiet and, they, and they're like, don't want to scare the otter and they want the otter to come up to them. Um, as opposed to, I've learned if they come up to your boat, just keep on moving. They're just trying to move you off and keep going and then you can avoid a bite. Um, if you don't push them away, then you, you do end up getting a bite. Um, this is also me on the kayak has also turned out to be one of the, one of the best solutions though. I'll get to that now. This is again how close one can get. Um, so I'm able to put the GoPro like right in front of their faces. We may be getting a whole lot of footage, but it is a tricky one because us monitoring them um, mustn't make them uh, more habituated to people. But at the same time, the only way we well, when I again arrived in, in January and had to figure this out, the only way to start answering questions was to try and actually figure out what their what the otters were thinking and what their plan was. I was quite relieved that their plan wasn't to actually come to people for for um, for engagement because that would have been a much more tricky one. I think it's very much just be actually people are in their space and they don't really want us there. And we do think that it had something to do with lockdown in that they had almost yeah, a year and a half of that hotel space entirely to themselves um, to settle in and then suddenly everyone was back. So. We put in a few um, mitigation things already. Um, we put signage up all over the VNA waterfront. Um, we have uh, the one and only has have put up things um, signage at their swimming pool because that's where one of the bites were actually taking place was when people were in their freshwater pool. Um, an interesting one that most otter people have been very interested in um, was we put a crocodile head out um, in one of the sections and otters were petrified of them. Um, petrified of this otter, of, of this of this crocodile head. Never seen a crocodile before, but um, knew it was something to be wary of. And then it took a couple of weeks, and then once it wasn't moved, they, yeah, they realized it wasn't real. That was quite an interesting one. Um, easy mitigation was here. You can see there's a ladder for people. It's a safety thing for people who are on the canal, who are swimming or supping or kayaking who need to get out, and a resident swimming pool. So I... I was able to see a few times Otter coming up that ladder, somebody in the swimming pool obviously came face to face with each other, which was not ideal. Um, and a simple thing there was just moving the ladder so that they don't come out right. They still come out, but not at, at somebody with their child in the swimming pool. Um, we've also suggested to the hotel that they put up a barrier. Um, you can see there it's going up. Um, that will just allow them not to get on that island because quite honestly as long as they've got foliage they've got fresh water um and they've got a, a, a yeah entire island there's 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 no way they're going to stop that otter coming back um when they start having people on the island again um we've also invested in at work with our seal program that we managed to do um invested in two kayaks um and two canal monitors um like i said the can people on the water um following the otters being able to preempt their move being able to tell people how to behave around the otters um, has actually been one of our biggest um, successes, but um, it's still it's still early days. Um, it's, it will create jobs for people um, and skills for people, so we really are hoping to get that off the ground before um, season. Um, going around the waterfront looking for other places that we can perhaps um, give them instead of the, the places that they've chosen. So this is also an interesting one. Um, this is our this, this is the back door to the aquarium. It's an old pool that we don't use anymore, and it's right in their path. And the idea was to potentially um, put fresh water in here and open up the open up the gates, so the otters can actually come and go, stay wild otters, but still actually be on display for people to to see them and also be able to give them a pool where they won't get in, in, into any trouble. So that's an idea we're working on. 
And another one is uh, from that aerial photograph I showed you at the beginning. Um, I think the reason they've chosen the one and only and, and that area is because of the foliage um, and sand. And nowhere else in the waterfront um, after the, that area is, is um, there's really no land left. So we're creating two um, plat floating platforms. Um, this is them in their early stages, so we've got quite a lot further now. That will have freshwater pools. There'll be a freshwater pool on each platform. Um, there will be foliage. There will be a little area to underneath between the floats to be able to get into, um, sand to roll in, um, and then we'll be able to float them near the canal and then potentially move them out further into the marina side because we don't have issues with swimmers or suppers on the marina side, um, whereas we do in the canal. And then be able to, once that's available to them, is potentially just manipulate where their fresh water is on the other side. Um, start cutting that down very slowly and hoping that they find this on their own. Um, yeah, and enjoy their otter safe islands. Just going to end with a picture of one of our otters. Still struggling to identify who's who. Um, but you can see this is right like in front of me. Um, a little bit too chilled for <laughs> an urban environment. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. That was uh, really interesting and interesting to hear kind of how they're connecting with with people and uh, obviously quite a big, substantial city and they're right in the middle of it. Um, one question I have is, obviously there's a, there's, there's a bit of a conflict with the hotels in particular. How do kind of general residents of that area or of Cape Town engage and do they like having the otters around or are they cautious of them as well? Sorry, Ben, just repeat the last bit of your question. Yeah, I was just wondering if like the kind of general residents of Cape Town, are they how do they react to the otters? So it's it's um they're reacting very well. Um so as I said, you've got it's quite a tricky one because you've got residents and then you've got um you've got residents who live there, residents of Cape Town who come in and use that water source. You've got hotel guests who are only there for three days from overseas and know nothing about it. And then you've got staff of the waterfront. So pretty much everybody except the um, the guests who just arrive have all been incredibly positive about it. And some of most of the people are actually too scared to report bites because they don't want anything bad to happen to the otters. Yeah, that's good in a way. That's a, it's good that the, the locals are engaging with it. So it's mainly kind of the tourists that are a bit cautious about it. Yeah, it's not even that they're too cautious. I think it's almost, it's it's the other way is, as I said, they like, I mm. think we were discussing it now. In fact, if the otters had quite a bad experience with people, they might be moving off a bit. But because everyone in Cape Town is kind of, you know, loves to see wildlife, knows how to behave around wildlife, they tend to go quiet and sit down and want the animal not to be scared and come up to you. The problem is with the otter just, yeah, takes yeah. takes the advantage of that. Um, so yeah, that's not ideal. We've got to work through that. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, just a couple of questions for you, if you don't mind. There's um, one person, Luz Salas, has said, is it possible that this could attract more otters and heighten or worsen the situation, the issue? So obviously, yes, at, at, at the beginning, there was a concern. You know, the waterfront's like, great, you're going to have... Um, you're going to have a family and then you're going to have baby otters and we're going to have like thousands of otters. And no, it was the other way around from what the es experts have told us is that um, you'll have your little, your family, whether it be five or six otters, but they, the, 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 the male will keep out all the other males um, and they'll start kicking the young males out as well. So we'll be just left with a quite a f tight family knit, but um, yeah, there'll be a limit to that if all goes well. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Heidi Davis, um, not a question as such, just said, Claire, so lovely of you to make sure these otters are getting given better options and to minimise human-animal conflicts. Good luck for the floating islands and pool by the aquarium. Um, and then Kiwi has said, the platforms are amazing and fingers crossed they work. How did you secure funding for these? Was it government funded? No, so our, uh, our government doesn't really fund anything like that. Um, it's been, I've been very lucky to work for the aquarium, which is owned by the waterfront as well. 
Um, so there's there's pretty much plenty of money there if you are able to prove what you want to prove. Um, we don't have a lot of money for research, unfortunately, which is what we're looking into now. But the waterfront is, as I said, they actually um, five years ago started this um, wildlife management program because they are very committed to try and to try and have this this massive waterfront facility, but keep the wildlife there. So it's in their best interest as well to to look good and to to do the best they can with this. So they've actually offered the money up for the the kayaks, the employment of two staff members, and the um, platforms. Oh, that's brilliant. And I take it within the canal system, there's a lot of prey for the otters as well. A lot of fish and that's why they're sticking around or do they leave and come back? So it's, um, they do leave and come back for a few, like three days at the most, but I don't think that's a, that doesn't seem to be a food thing. That's more likely to be a, um, potentially going to check their perimeter for other males in the area. Um, but food, the the canal is we actually we actually as an aquarium um, we seeded that canal years ago with fish. So now you've got huge fish in there, um, and then on the marina side as well, like like just endless amounts of of life, crabs, yes. fish, sharks, octopus, like everything. There's no shortage of food for them. No, that's great. I guess uh, the posi one positive is that with otters you can kind of guarantee that there's fish underneath. So. You got kind of a balance in the, in that little ecosystem as well. Yeah, that's what we're trying to show them. I think that you've got a top predator in your environment, and that's yeah. pretty pretty good going. Yeah. Uh, that's good. Uh, there's another couple of questions coming in now. Is there any case that otters are injured by accident due to human animal conflict in Cape Town? In that case, um, do does your aquarium care for them? So as I said, I'm quite quite new to that and to, new to this and getting my head into the otter world. But um, yeah, what's what's interesting is that up until now, most of the otters have only been seen in you know at, you you'd find some road kill maybe an otter trying to cross the road from the mountain to to the sea or something around Cape Town, but it was not huge. It was mainly just car accidents, if anything. But that's because they were traveling in the evenings. Now it's almost happened at the same time that we're getting um, reports all over Cape Town and up, up like the Western Cape of otters m um, moving around during the day in broad daylight, like one, two o'clock. There's just no time schedule anymore. So I think that being hit by cars is almost a little bit less. Um, but the problem is now that they're coming across people all the time, um, which is going to create other issues. In terms of a rehab, um, there isn't any rehab down in Cape in Cape Town, um, otters, I mean, they're formidable creatures. Um, yeah, we have, I think there are a few, our SPCA, like your RSPCA, um, do, do do a few things, but by the time we get an otter, like an adult otter, they, um, there's not much to be done with it. So, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Anne's asked, um, oh, it's going up because more questions coming. Uh, is it to do with fresh water availability? UK otters living in seawater need fresh water to clean their their fur. So could the drought in Cape Town mean they have become more reliant on fountains, etc.? Um, so it's absolutely the same in terms of fresh water, that they absolutely rely on cleaning themselves in fresh water. Um, but there's no more drought in Cape Town. Um, there's, there's a huge amount of water around now, a huge amount of rain, um, a huge amount of mountain with streams. Um, yeah, I think we just actually got a lot more otters than we used to have. Okay. Um, there's a suggestion you, you could put up an otter cam once they've accept the alternatives and maybe collect donations by people who love them, but preferably from afar. Um, Deborah Dawson says, how can you identify individuals? Have you tried uh, DNA profiling from spread samples? So there's a good question. I'm hoping I'm going to meet somebody on this webinar who can help me do this. Um, we haven't identified them individually yet. Um, I've started getting some really nice photographs of their faces and nose markings and eyes. Um, but yeah, the, um, unfortunately, being down in South Africa, there's not a huge amount of DNA sampling and stuff. I have spoken to Nicola about, about doing that. Um, but it's a case of 
of why would we want to do that actually we know we've got the four it'll be a huge amount of money to do dna sampling and there might not be a good reason to actually know that i'm much more keen to have them just um i'd love them each like to have a color to have a nice big you know so somebody can say oh the green otter's coming red otter's coming blue otter's coming um at the moment it's otter's coming and um, we haven't got far enough as to you know there's definitely a, a, a difference in behavior i got chased out of the water um when i was swimming there by one and i think it was one of the females but i would love to figure out a way to do it i managed to get um special paint uh, like that bovine paint i managed yeah. to get up to one of the ones like you saw in my last slide lying like fast asleep right next to me spread spread him down hectically um and two minutes later he'd rolled in the sand and that was the end of that i couldn't identify him anymore so if anyone has brilliant <laughs> ideas with that please yeah let me know <laughs> So we'll just ask you one more question from Sarah Duplessis, who's asked, do you think the auto population in Cape Town is growing and that's why, and could that be why they're moving into more urban areas? Yeah, I do think that. Um, I think, I mean, urban areas are definitely squashing them, um, but actually uh, I think otters are actually doing quite, quite well at the moment. We, we find that with Caracal as well, um, getting Caracal back on Table Mountain, um you know the healthier we get the ecosystem and the healthier we get our species back then you got the you got um the, the yeah the problem and the same with baboons um those are all doing everything's doing so well that now everything's coming in contact with people um and just creating a completely different issue yeah that makes sense well claire thank you very much for your presentation and for enlightening us on your work so well. that's brilliant um now um, we're going to pass over to Heather Barrett of Sea Otter Savvy and her presentation, which is Being Sea Otter Savvy. So before I hand over to Heather, I will give you a little introduction to her and her organisation. So Heather's interest in sea otter conservation and ecology has developed through her undergraduate degree at UC Santa Cruz, internship through the Monterey Bay Aquarium and graduate research at Moss Landing Marine Laboratories. As a science communication director of Sea Otter Savvy, Heather refines science communication strategies over overseas creation and promotion of science related materials, leads science related media relations and develops special projects for outreach. As the research scientist, Heather continues her research interests in human disturbance to sea otters. So thank you again, Heather, for joining us and I'll hand the floor to yourself. Hi, thank you, Ben, so much. I'm so excited to be here for World Otter Day. Let me just share my screen and start the presentation. So yeah. hi, everyone. Hopefully that, does that look good? Yeah, that's okay. great, thanks. Okay, great. Um, so thank you all for joining us today, and I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about sea otters, so I think I'm going to start with sort of gauging everyone's um, basic knowledge of sea otters since there are so many otters talked about today. And then I'm gonna go into more about our program, our research or outreach and really understanding how we share space with sea otters. Um, and similar to Claire, we are definitely having some sea otter human conflicts. <laughs> so I'll be touching on that today as well. But since we are here to learn about so many different uh, otters, um, I wanted to go over that sea otters are the heaviest of the weasels of the mustelid family. And in California, the males can be up to 90 pounds. And in Alaska, where sea otters are um, a little bit larger, they can be up to 100 pounds. So these are large animals. And sea otters are a marine mammal, meaning that they rely on the ocean and other marine ecosystems for their existence. And they're one of the smallest of the marine mammals. And they're also one of the most recent additions to the marine environment. So they definitely have some adaptations. You can see their flippers there. And fun fact is they are the only mammal with paws in the front and flippers in the back. Um, but they're also met with some challenges, which I'm gonna discuss in just a moment. But there are three recognized subspecies of sea otter. You have the Asian Russian sea otter, the Northern sea otter, and the Southern sea otter, which is the smallest. And we also call them the California sea otter, which is our main focus. So pre-European colonization, the worldwide population was estimated to be between 150,000 to 300,000 individuals. And their range can be seen in black. Um, however, the arrival of the, in Alaska of Russian explorers in about 1741, there was extensive commercial harvest of sea otters for their fur um, for over 150 years, and that resulted in the near extirpation of the species. 
So when sea otters were afforded protection by the International Forest Seal Treaty in 1911, there was probably fewer than 2,000 animals that remained in 13 colonies, and those colonies you can see is those red circles. Now here we see the current range, which is in yellow, and the historic range, which is in red. And I've highlighted the Southern Sea Otters range to the right, um, which is in California. Now the California Sea Otters current range extends from Gaviota, which is here in the South, um, up to approximately Pigeon Point here in the North, which is a little bit South of San Francisco Bay. Now the heat map you see is density. So the, the red zones here, here, um, those are the areas with the highest numbers of sea otters. And the current California pseudo population is approximately 3,000 individuals. And so if you're considering their historical range, it is not that many. I also would like to point out here is the state of California. Um, and their range is really just in the central. There are no sea otters in the south and there's no sea otters in the north. So the southern sea otter was listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act in 1977. And this was because of the reduced range, the population size, as well as the vulnerability to oil spills from coastal tanker traffic. But sea otters are also protected under our Marine Mammal Protection Act. And this protects marine mammals in US waters. And in 1994, there was an amendment and now species are protected against harassment or human disturbance. And the reason that is important is because it is definitely an issue here. <laughs> so it's becoming difficult for people to recognize certain actions as being disturbance to wildlife, but in reality, it's a growing concern in the discussion of human wildlife conflict. Now, these images are just a few, but all of them are depicting people getting extremely close to wild animals. We do feel that social media, the birth of the smartphone has definitely um, increased these um, interactions. <laughs> um, so with disturbance, there is potential for increased avoidance behavior, increased stress levels. Oh no, that's unfortunate. Um, I'm so sorry. Let's see if I can get that to work again. Let me, apparently my PowerPoint just crashed. I can always share from my end if, if I need to. Uh, it's just opening now. I'm so sorry, guys. That's OK. That has never happened. But I guess that's why <laughs> I sent you that backup, right? <laughs> so oh, my goodness. OK, let me just get back to my right slide. It's always something. That's it. That's technology. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now I got to go back to my, my main screen so that way I can share the screen. Here we go. Portion, share. Let's get this started again. Yeah, that's perfect. That's... Oh, okay, sorry guys. That's all right. <laughs> Slight dilemma, but um, what I was trying to get across to you guys was that um, with disturbance, there's definitely um, a lot of issues that can affect sea otter behavior, species behavior, stress levels, it can reduce foraging, habituation, it can change their habitat use. And um, there's ultimately potential for injury for the animal or even the human, which Claire actually discussed really nicely in hers. Um, so disturbance and harassment is definitely not just a sea otter issue, um, as we just heard. But I would argue that sea otters are at particular risk due to their behavior and their unique physiology. So this is an infrared video clip, and it's really to give you all a sense of how much heat sea otters lose to the cold water. Pacific is very, very cold. And you can see the heat trail um, and the areas where they're losing most of their heat, which is going to be the eyes, the nose, the ears, the paws. Now, sea otters run hot, so they have extremely high metabolic rates to make sure that they can maintain their internal temperature despite living in cold ocean water. And it's this need to keep fuel in their tank per se that has them consuming over a quarter of their body weight in food each day. So to give you an example, if you are 150 pounds, that's like eating 150 quarter pounder hamburgers every day. And that's a lot of food. <laughs> um, but if we're looking at an evolutionary timeline, sea otters are youngsters living in the ocean compared to other marine mammals. And they have a dilemma. They do not store fat as blubber. They are extremely, extremely lean. And this poses a problem since we know that blubber, which is a special type of really thick fat, is excellent insulation to the cold. So if they can't get fat enough to stave off hypothermia, there has to be some other ways. Um, but this definitely comes with pros and cons. So instead of blubber for insulation, sea otters have extremely thick fur that can hold warm air. 
and they have the thickest fur of any mammal and can have up to 1 million hairs per square inch, depending on the body location. And it's that fur that got them in trouble in the first part. Everyone loves their fur. Um, their fur consists of two types of hairs. You have the interlocking under fur, which you can see there's little barbs here. They connect together and when sea otters groom, they can blow warm air into that. Um, and then they have longer guard hairs and that helps the water run off of their coat. Now this system, it's trapping a layer of air next to their skin. So when the fur is really well groomed, their skin does not come in contact with the cold sea of water. Um, this is why grooming is so important. It takes up a big portion of their day and it's why they're at particular risk for pollution. Um, they survive in cold water because of this fur. So without it, or even if there's injury, damage, a cut, this can make them very quickly hypothermic. So there's a concern for their energetic balance. Like if we were considering that just maintaining oneself is expensive, if you're losing all this heat and trying to eat a ton to make up for that, imagine the increased cost for a reproductive female. So I'm gonna add a pup into the mix. Now, lactation is the most energetically demanding period in a female mammal's life. And for female sea otters, their energetic demand nearly doubles during lactation and pup care. So you can see here at zero, that is when the pup is born in this dark gray. This is the metabolic demands just for the female. But then she also has to lactate and produce enough for her pup and that's in black. And you can see how much that increases. So recent research has also shown that this demand has females living at their energetic limits. End lactation syndrome is the massive depletion of energy reserves post weaning. And that's just emaciation or the starvation that can lead to death. And ELS was the major cause of death in 57% of the females from this study in Monterey. So here is stage five, this is post weaning for the pups. This is the female now on her own, 90% of these females that were um, looked at were emaciated. So balancing their energetic budget is really critical for sea otters and it's a huge concern for females. And this is why resting is so important for them and giving them space. So if this is the case, if, if it's really difficult to balance that energetic budget, I have had people ask me, why do sea otters exist? <laughs> Um, well, they do, there's behavior that they can do that helps manage this for them. So they increase a lot, right? They increase their intake, they eat a ton. Um, and this can actually depend on the location. They can um, increase, especially if there's prey available. Decrease their output. Like I just mentioned, resting is really, really important. And it's a huge part of what Sea Otter Savvy tries to educate to the public is that when you see a resting sea otter, they need that rest. Um, and maintaining insulation, make sure that they're grooming enough to make sure that that cold water never touches their skin so they're not losing heat and wasting energy. So if we're gonna break these down, these activities down into their day, it's very clear that resting and feeding are critical. So if you're feeding 34% of your day, that is a lot of food and we've already mentioned that. Um, and this consumption actually in turn puts pressure on the surrounding nearshore biological community because of the amount of prey that they have to consume. Now I wanna note that these are just averages specific to Monterey, but depending on location and individuals, this can actually be up to 50% that they um, are feeding during their day in a 24 hour period. So all that eating definitely has ecological implications. Now sea otters are considered a keystone species and that means that they're an organism that has a very large scale community effect that's disproportionate to how many individuals there are. And the term stems from architecture so the keystone or that center stone is putting pressure on the supporting stones and it creates an arch. So when that keystone is removed, the remaining stones fall. And it's an analogy that the ecological community is altered. These interactions may disappear or change. Now for central California specifically, there are two examples of this. We have kelp forests um, that you can see on the left and eelgrass communities on the right. With the presence of sea otters, urchin populations are regulated allowing kelp to grow, which you can see on the left, as are crabs and eelgrass communities in estuaries on the right. But once I remove those sea otters, the trophic cascades, you can really see those, how those cascades change, how that biomass changes. Now in the kelp forest, the urchin populations increases and that limits kelp growth, which can result in urchin barrens. And you can see that photo on the left. While similarly for eelgrass communities, with the increased crab population, um, they consume the sea slugs, which releases the algae from pressure and ultimately smothers the eelgrass, which restricts growth and makes very patchy. Um, and ultimately these ecological communities in certain areas along the Pacific coast have been experiencing altered systems for a very long time. So sea otter research has shown again and again that there's positive, positive benefits um, for the biological community as a whole. And 
We like to say that sea otters are ecosystem superheroes. With their presence and that forging pressure that regulates the grazers, there is increased biodiversity, which can lead to better fisheries, increased carbon storage. Many people don't realize this, but more with more kelp and eelgrass, you have more carbon sequestration, which has larger climate implications, as well as there's potential economic benefits for the presence of sea otters. So what now? <laughs> sea otters were in San Francisco Bay and estuaries. They were from all the way to the Pacific coast, from Baja, California, all the way up over to Japan. But there are no sea otters in San Francisco Bay or Northern California for over 100 years. But recent research has um, used population modeling and revealed that if they were to return to San Francisco Bay specifically, it could potentially more than double the current sea otter population. And now from a long-term study in Elkhorn Slough, where sea otters um, from Monterey Bay Aquarium surrogacy program were reintroduced to the estuary with huge success. We know that bays, sloughs, estuaries, they make for perfect sea otter habitat. You can see this is a female resting on the bank of the pickle pinks of the pickleweed and elkhorn slough. So sea otters are still missing from very large chunks of their range and they are ecologically important. They also have cultural significance for local tribes and current conservation efforts are really really starting to discuss and look into the potential for reintroduction of sea otters, possible reintroduction of sea otters into Northern California to hopefully restore what many communities have been missing since range expansion has been um, stagnant. And so that might lead you to wonder, well, why is it so stagnant? With all this protection that we've had and it, why hasn't natural range expansion occurred for almost 20 years? Why is there even a discussion around potential for reintroduction? And though there is not a, a 100% sure answer. It is possible that it is due in part to three main things that I like to break down is geography, behavior, and predation. Now, north of Año Nuevo, which was that furthest northern part of their current range in central California, there is sandy bottom and it does not facilitate kelp growth. Um, plus, in northern California, our kelp forests have not been consistent. So they have been missing their keystone species for a very, very long time. And there are a lot of urchin barrens. Secondly, we know that female sea otters, um, they need places of refuge. So the kelp forest, the eelgrass, um, and they have very strong site fidelity, which means they do not like to go very far from home. And lastly, the main cause for sea otter mortality in recent years in Central California has been white shark bites. Anyo is a elephant seal rookery. And those young elephant seals are very tasty <laughs> for white sharks. And those juvenile white sharks actually begin to hunt marine mammals in their teen years. They swap from um, fish into marine mammals. So with poor eyesight and a curious bite and sort of a learning curve, um, this leaves sea otters with a bit of a gauntlet to cross. And, and there's really not a safe place for them to go for quite a long distance. Um, and Central California is really crowded. Um, a lot of these otters are urban otters for us. Um, so they always have to navigate that human aspect as well. So given the serious conversation around range expansion and possible reintroduction, um, we have a We Were Here Sea Otter program and it's providing science-based educational outreach to communities missing sea otters from historical range. And we're providing these communities with resources and tools to learn more about natural sea otter um, range expansion or potential for reintroduction, as well as share their voice um, as stakeholders through their website with a questionnaire that we have to gauge public opinion over time. We seek to actively include all communities, First Nations, inner city, coastal businesses, industry and government representatives and more. Now, if you're interested, you can find the We Were Here page and stakeholder survey through our website at seaottersavvy.org. But now that I hopefully caught everyone up a little bit about some Sea Otter 101 and the current status for the Southern Sea Otter, um, I'm gonna wrap up with touching on more about our research and outreach programs. So the mission of Sea Otter Savvy is to foster awareness and stewardship in um, coastal communities and the wildlife viewing public to reduce human sea otter conflict and disturbance and increase an ethic of coexistence. And to do this, we use sort of two forms. We use research um, and we're really founded on community science. So we have an amazing group of volunteers and interns that are trained by sea otter biologists and they collect behavioral scan data um, along with potential disturbance stimuli data. And they have been doing this um, now for over six years. We have an ongoing long-term data set. And from this, we're able to then piece out and investigate impacts of disturbance to sea otters. So this is just one small portion of some of the research we do. But one of the objectives of the research and a big part of um, my thesis was to investigate how distance and location influences the impact of disturbance specifically on the Southern sea otter. And this figure illustrates the concept that you, you're gonna be that stimuli, that, you're that shadowy kayaker. 
And as you get closer and closer, there's gonna be a gradient of behavior change for the sea otter. And so there's potential disturbance thresholds or zones. Now on the y-axis, that relative effect of activity state is just the probability or the likelihood that the sea otter is going to become disturbed and change their activity. Um, and the x-axis is the stimuli or that kayak's distance from the otter. Now, Due to Sea Otter Savvy's impressive data set that we have because of our citizen scientists, um, that includes multiple sites. We're able to break this down um, by location as well and show the average across sites, which is in black. So as that kayaker is getting closer and closer, um, the potential for disturbance for that sea otter increases exponentially. And we can start to see that as a first to change an alert and then potentially a distinguished activity change, which is like diving under the water, what we call a full flush. Um, we can then isolate inflection points and thresholds from this to help generate graphics for outreach purposes. So for example, from our distance results, we were able to create infographics like this, this is based in science, um, that are distributed to businesses and partners as a tool to increase awareness and assist marine recreation businesses with customer orientation. Now, especially when you pair this with verbal orientation like this, we convey information to those that may have been previously unaware of their potential impact. And the hope is that it will result in behavior change from those that are recreating. Um, the second part is our outreach. We use community stewardship. Um, so there are many businesses that live alongside sea otters in Central California. So sea otter savvy, we've come up with a certification process for these businesses with our community active wildlife stewards program cause. And we utilize social marketing as a technique, which is we're applying marketing principles to create value in order to influence target audience behaviors and benefit the community as a whole. And I'm really happy to say that we have an amazing team of um, cause businesses and it's growing every year and we actually have businesses reaching out to us, which is really exciting. Um, so to really the takeaway from this is I really want you guys to realize that at least here for our sea otter experience is that behavior change really starts with you. It starts with us, that we can be role models. Um, this desire that so many people come to Central California to have one-on-one -on -one intimate <laughs> cuddle parties with sea otters is definitely causing some issues for these otters. Um, and they really do need to have their space. Your distance does matter um, as disturbance has a cost for them. So the beauty is that we do feel that coexistence is possible in these urban areas. It is with the power of every individual that visits sea otter habitat to make a difference and simply just demonstrating respect for sea otters as their neighbors and all wildlife by giving them space and leaving no trace of your presence behind. So with that, I would like to thank all of our advisors, support and research affiliates, and I'm happy to take any questions. You can also feel free to contact me directly and remember to respect the NAP. And of course you can follow us on um, social media. No, it was brilliant, uh, Heather. Thank you so much for sharing sharing your presentation. So sorry for the falling apart in the middle. No, that's fine. That's fine. That happens. Um, one question I have uh, in regards, obviously, I know you guys work a lot on basically trying to keep kayakers and paddle warriors away from ours. Is that a, a legal thing? Is there like any le legislation to say they can't go this close? For so it's such a trick. This is like that gray area. Yes, it is illegal. So by definition, it is illegal to disturb or harass a marine mammal. And that can include just them looking at you. That is changing their behavior. The minute you change your behavior by law, you are disturbing them. However, <laughs> there comes a point where that's a that's great to put into law, but it's really difficult to enforce that. And here there is a point at which through our research, we've learned, as I mentioned, we took this at different locations. Every location is different. These populations, these subpopulations you have from north, like the southern end of that to the northern end of that have very different reactions, um, just dependent if they're in a slough, if they're otters that are living in the slough versus otters that are living more coast, like outward coastally. So it's really difficult to say you have to stay just this distance away because in another area that might not be the case. So what we try to do is really emphasize um, and ultimately you can call departments and say, hey, someone disturbed a sea otter and they're like, well, we don't have enough people to come out and do anything about this. So what we try to do is really go away from the idea of don't do this to really being like, join us, be part of this community and do do this. And we have found that since starting this and really being the like, don't do this and wagging a finger that never gets you anywhere. People get so defensive. They don't understand that. Oh, it looked at me. Why is that a bad thing? Oh, it swam up to me or away from me. That's that. Why is that a bad thing? Um, 
it's so complex. And so we definitely feel that trying to go in the route of bringing everyone in in a positive way as being part of this community has actually been allowing us to get further and further. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Heidi Davis has asked, um, what about uh, what about illnesses that CRs can contract? Is that an obstacle to range expansion too? Very good question. Um, so there are definitely diseases that go through the population occasionally, and I'd actually say that one of more of the conversation related to that is is when theaters the populations at carrying capacity. So there's recent research that's also I didn't touch on this, but um, there are papers that have looked at population modeling just for Monterey Bay, which is one of the densest areas we have for sea otters, and it is likely that they are already at carrying capacity, which means prey is limited. This is one of the reasons why we might also be seeing female sea otters dying because of starvation. Um, so maybe not just the fact that there are urban otters and there's um, lots of pressures. And, and once you reach a point of stage three starvation, a lot of diseases can affect that too. So it's one thing to say that your body condition's low, but that allows other diseases to multiple causes of death, right? Um, so range expansion, if anything, you would assume that if you could expand out those range ends, you would have less of those moments of disease. So it's when you get more otters close together, you're gonna to have more of that transmission. But transmission is to humans too is definitely a concern with the desire people have with social media sort of running rampant for us. I mean, it's really hard to battle out TikTok and Instagram and people really wanting to take selfies with sea otters and Disney's cuddle party themes and all of that to emphasize that they are wild animals, they will bite you. And there have been cases of that. Um, they are large, people don't really, I mean, they're hundred pounds sometimes. So they're very, very big. Um, <laughs> but you don't notice that when they're sitting half in the water, but um, it's definitely a concern. And there are really nasty things they can give to people. So when they are bitten, they do have to go to a specific, um, a doctor to, to make sure that they're getting the right antibiotics. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, the, we have a question. Um, asking what would be the first steps in reintroducing CRs to the San Francisco Bay? Excellent question. Um, we're actually sort of in the first steps right now. I We discussed a lot with those in the agency, it's in the management positions. And so as a nonprofit, Sea Otter Savvy is able to do some of the things that you know agencies can't do, which is to really do a lot of the outreach. And what we have been asked of specifically is to reach stakeholders. We need to hear from everyone. And so right now the discussion around possibility of reintroduction is there's going to be a feasibility study. So that's looking at what potential locations there are. There's already research looking at different prey available sites. So the, that side of it's already underway. But one of the biggest foundations we have to have is making sure that these coastal communities in California are prepared and they understand and that they're on board because they're there's a long history of sea otter human conflict up in Alaska, Canada, where decisions were made and fisheries and industry was not included in these conversations and it kind of backfired. And that's not our goal here. We want to make sure that any of those agricultural fisheries industries are included in this conversation. Yeah, good answer. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, I think that's all your questions, unless anyone later on, maybe we can ask some more at the end. So thank you, Heather, again for, for joining us and for your presentation. Of course. Fantastic. Thanks. So our next uh, presentation isn't going to be a presentation as such. It's actually going to be a video that was produced um, between Javier Trevelli and Valentina Diaz Saravia. Um, Javier is, as you will, and actually I'm not going to give too much of an introduction into Javier himself because um, the video kind of does that really well. Um, but I'll give a, a brief bio into both of them just to give you an idea, and then I'll share the video all being well. So. So on Javier himself, um, since the beginning of his professional life in 2006, uh, Javier Trevelli made the decision to live in the front of the sea and has worked throughout the time in projects related to the conservation of the coastline, environmental education, and the rehabilitation and reintegration of marine fauna, achieving to be the first person to successfully rehabilitate and reinsert chungungos or marine otters back into their natural habitat. President of Chinchimin, since 2013. Today he is working together with his team in order to propose a plan for the conservation and restoration of the Chungungo habitat, planning a citizen monitoring program that allows evaluating the state of conservation of the Chungungo in the Valparaiso region, Chile, and designing the first rescue centre to receive Chungungos. 
uh, Valentina Diaz Savaria uh, um, is a journalist with a specialization in documentary filmmaking and has recently graduate, graduated from the wildlife filmmaking at UWE Bristol in partnership with the BBC. She was the one that helped produce the video uh, and tells the story of Javier Chinchiman and re-ottering Chile, as they so perfectly put it. Um, I don't want to go into too much more detail about exactly what both of them have done, because I think the video tells the story without me needing to say too much. But before um, I do that, I just say thank you to both of you for being here. And hopefully any questions afterwards you can answer. So I'm just going to share my screen, Valentina, if you're ready, in case it doesn't go well. Um, but it should be fine. So there's just a, I've brilliantly put video. There isn't. Uh, Al sur del mundo, en las costas del Océano Pacífico de Chile, hay un esquivo depredador. El gato de mar, o chungungo, como lo llamaron los mapuches, se esconde entre las rocas y algas. Son territoriales, juguetones y excelentes cazadores. Son el depredador tope de este ecosistema. Y por eso son excepcionalmente importantes. Pero lamentablemente, como muchas otras especies de Chile y el mundo, están bajo amenaza. Y como siempre, es nuestra culpa. Pero hay alguien que está luchando por salvarlos. Javier Trivelli lleva trabajando con chungungos hace ya 15 años y hoy, junto a la organización Chinchimén, tienen un plan. El hábitat de los chungungos lo he podido ver que se ha deteriorado. Lo que nosotros estamos buscando es poder repoblar Chile con chungungos en las zonas donde, donde ya son muy poco frecuentes de avistar. Javier, junto a su equipo, desarrollaron un sistema único para ayudar a los chungungos. Estas madrigueras podrían ser la clave para repoblar Chile. Un cachorro de chungungo. La idea nace con el objetivo de reinsertar un chungungo en una madriguera. Esto ocurre en uno de los últimos lugares en que estas nutrias están en relativo equilibrio. Javier quiere lograr ayudarlas para tener más éxito de supervivencia en un ambiente extremadamente desfavorable para ellas. Y vamos a ver qué tanto le gusta. Vamos a ver. <risa> Nuestro objetivo es poder transitar hacia la reinserción, hacia lugares donde las nutrias ya son poco frecuentes. Con la idea de mejorar las poblaciones de nutrias donde, donde, no, donde ya quedan poquitas. Estas madrigueras cuentan con dos pisos, una entrada y un dormitorio. Javier instala cámaras en su interior para monitorear su éxito. Ahí debería ir esto. ¡Oh, y otra vez me quedo corto! El mejor escenario sería que una hembra la ocupara. O sea, imagínate tener una chungunga pariendo en vivo en cámara, bueno. Qué maravilloso sería. Perfecto. Va a funcionar. Va a funcionar. Vamos a ver. La prueba de fuego. Pero este proyecto es más que solo madrigueras. Chinchimen es la única organización que ha logrado reinsertar chungungos exitosamente. Y hay una nutria con la que él tuvo una gran conexión. Para mí, con Changuita hay un antes y un después de los chungungos. una cajita en avión. La changuita fue la primera chungunga reinsertada exitosamente. Chiquitito, mira las patitas. 
pero fue, vivió un momento muy crítico. Realmente peligrando su vida, eh, no estábamos preparados para recibirla tampoco. O sea, ella estuvo con riesgo de muerte cerca de dos o tres meses. ¿Cómo no te va a cautivar? <risa> Un día estábamos con ella en la roca y ella emprendió su propio viaje. Y después de 10 meses retorna a Maitencillo eh, y tenemos un encuentro con ella que fue para mí maravilloso. Ella me reconoce y se me mete, ¿cierto? Como que se acerca a mis pies y yo como que me agacho y ella se mete en la chaqueta y todos nos abrazamos. Y ella estaba totalmente bien, estaba bien de peso, bien hidratada, así que nada, yo lo único que hago es sacarla, dejarla y la changuita después de eso se va y esa fue la, la última vez que, que la vi. Pero este no fue un camino fácil. El principal desafío con el que nos encontramos nosotros fue lograr que crías de chungungo de dos o tres semanas de edad pudiesen llegar a etapa de reinserción. Los chungungos morían en el proceso de rehabilitación. Eso afortunadamente lo logramos. Hoy día tenemos un éxito de cerca del 80-90% de sobrevivencia, situación que antes eh, llegaba a cero. Rescatarlos es solo una parte del trabajo. En Chile los chungungos se están extinguiendo. Por eso Javier y Chinchimén están buscando que las madrigueras sean la esperanzadora solución a este grave problema. Hemos podido ver también que hay una demanda de madrigueras de las, de las poblaciones nativas. Nos impone muchos desafíos. Los acantilados de Quiriyuca son el lugar perfecto para poner a prueba las madrigueras. Pero no es tarea fácil. Javier tiene que bajar aproximadamente 100 metros con tablas y herramientas en su espalda. Una caída desde esta altura podría ser fatal. Y ahora hay que bajar este acantilado. Ahora nos vamos a, a preparar para, para el descenso. Ojalá todo resulte bien. Todo ha venido resultando bien, así que vamos para adelante nomás. A esperar que esto, que esto resulte. Creo que igual nos va a ir más o menos bien. Cuidado. Vale, vaya. Tío. Ya una vez abajo, hay que empezar a trabajar antes de que suba la marea. La idea es instalar un tubo para que la nutria entre y localizar la madriguera en una zona seca. Pero primero, necesitan muchas, muchas rocas. Ah, y cuando llegué, no las tirí porque se parten. Ya Ahí sí. Me quedó la agua completa dentro. Tendría que ir una super marejada para que se la comiera el mar. Pero no creo. Listo, ya estamos más o menos para cerrar acá. ¿Estamos listos? Solo nos falta poner más y más rocas. Esto es nuestro sistema de cámara en vivo. 
Por aquí vamos a monitorear, tiene sensor de movimiento, pura tecnología, cámara en vivo. A ver cómo queda. Ya con todo instalado, solo queda cubrir con rocas y esperar a que funcione. Yo creo que llenemos acá también porque esta va a llegar una pura ola y la... Yeah. Buena. Vamos a venir a ver si es que... Si habemos chungungo. ¿Cómo van a ir a saludar uno por lo menos? Será el gran día. Recibimos un llamado de la caleta de pescadores de Maitencillo con el aviso de que hay un chungungo en los bins donde guardan los pescados con hielo. Los chungungos en general no se acercan a la gente y ese lugar en particular es bien riesgoso por la cantidad de gente, la cantidad de perros. El aumento considerable en el balneario, bueno, eso puede haber perturbado su, su hábitat natural. Recordemos que llevábamos cerca de un año y medio con muy poca gente en el balneario. Hoy día fue a buscar refugio a, a un lugar muy antropizado, muy lleno de humanos, de perros, y eso fue lo que justificó el rescate. El chungungo solo habita el 20% de tiempo en el mar, solo se alimenta ahí, y el 80% del tiempo lo pasa en tierra. Y ahí tenemos una gran pérdida de hábitat por la invasión inmobiliaria, sobre todo acá en la, en, en la costa central, ¿cierto? que los hemos ido agotando y apretando. Eh, casi en todo Chile te diría yo que la presencia de perros es una de las principales presiones que tienen estos chungungos y por su pérdida de hábitat. Las madrigueras de los chungungos son en seco, entonces cuando la cría sale a curiosear, eh, muchas de ellas son depredadas por perros. En el mar también se, se, se ha visto deteriorada la, su hábitat. La pesca ha disminuido y muchos pescadores hoy día se están dedicando a la extracción de algas, que son el hábitat principal donde se alimenta esta especie. Después de un mes y medio, es tiempo de visitar la madriguera para saber si fue exitosa. ¿Qué pasó con esa madre? Ya con la marea baja, Javier comienza su descenso. No sabe con qué se va a encontrar. Ojalá algún chungungo le haya gustado la madriguera. Hay que revisar que no haya nadie en casa. Los olores podrían delatar si algún chungungo visitó la madriguera. Pero la única forma de saber es revisar si hay o no algún registro. Ya, eh, escucha, para nosotros una tremenda noticia. Eh, 
eh, esto no lo habíamos visto nunca antes. Una cría lactando de su madre. Es lo que estábamos buscando hace dos años, que llevamos, o tres años. Repoblar de chungungos en toda la zona entre el sur de la región de Valparaíso y el norte de la región de Los Ríos, que el chungungo es muy poco frecuente y ahí ha sido, está casi extinto en esa zona. Entonces, poder ir repoblando ese espacio de chungungo con estos chungunguitos chiquititos eh, sería una maravilla. Y nada, pues, con toda la energía y todo el amor por los chungungos para que ayudarlos a reproducirse a que estén bien en la naturaleza y nosotros poder reinsertar a todos aquellos chungungos que por culpa del humano eh, quedan abandonados o han perdido su madre. That was fantastic. I love watching that video. I've watched it two or three times now. It's just it's uh -huh. amazing. And I think everybody else uh, probably agree with that. Um, one question I have uh, for yourself, uh, Valentina, is why did you choose to, obviously you're a kind of a wildlife uh, filmmaker rather than an otter filmmaker. Why did you choose Javier and his, his work? Um... Well, I met Javier a few years ago and the work he does, I think is very important. I, well, I'm a passionate about the natural world and I wanted to go through, through that route. That's why I came to Bristol um, to, to study about it and be able to keep working on it. And I chose this story as my final film for the masters that I was doing. Um, and I just, I wanted a, a story with um, a lot of passion and also with a good message Uh, for conservation for a keystone species as the chungungo is also because it's not uh, very 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 known as other species that we have in Chile yeah. and I thought it was very important to put it out um, and show people that we have such an incredible animal living super close to everyone um, so yeah that was the main the main reason and the work that Chin Chi Men does and Javier work as well is is very amazing so I wanted to put yeah, it definitely. Out. I think your video, uh, your your documentary really portrays um, not only uh, Javier's work, but his passion, which is yeah. amazing. And Javier, I think it's amazing what you do and you can also see how much you love doing it, which is fantastic. Has anybody got any questions for either Valentina or Javier? I'm sure there was a lot of good comments. Um, someone said, a man with a passion, fabulous. <laughs> yeah, that was Dennis. Heidi said, Loved it, held my breath while watching. So <laughs> it's obviously uh, both your, your work, Javi, and Valentina has obviously portrayed it perfectly. Thank you for those messages. Well, I've shared the link as well because I it might be, have been my internet that it was like a bit caught and the audio wasn't linked with the, the subtitles, but it probably is my internet because it's very bad. <laughs> um, oh, okay. But yeah, I shared the link. So anyone that wants to watch it after, like, feel free to. To share it or like watch it again yeah that's perfect and uh javi what where why did you focus on chungungo instead of other species mm, hi everyone um thank you for the invitation ben you're welcome uh chungungo it's a very special species for for us it's uh no no a lot of people know them and uh and it used some portion of of, of seawater and and other parts of uh, the continent so uh 
my passion is, my passion is uh, to to preserve coastal zones and 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 Chungungo uh, use these uh, both parts. So uh, that's the way I I, I start to relate it with uh, with the Chungungos uh, Chinchimen. Uh, it's uh, an organization to that uh, grow to protect this this species. So um, I think that uh, if we can protect otters and their habitat, uh, we can uh, preserve the, our coastal zones that it has a lot of biodiversity more than just Tungungos. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I can, can agree more. So Anne has asked, uh, is there work to try and improve the habitat and can the government help protect the species and areas? Oof, um, it's, a, <laughs> it's a really hard uh, question because um, the fishermen here uh, uh, have a very difficult uh, time to to make the, the, the their fishing um, activities. Um, fisheries are very um, deteriorated here in Chile. Uh, only 25 or 30 percent of the fisheries are, are in good uh, wealth. So uh, most of fishermen, there are a lot of fishermen to, to, to put their attentions not only in the algae, that is the, the, the habitat, uh, than to uh, this um, I don't know how to say it, this um, bentonic resource. I don't know, it's bentonics, it's okay, no? Like this um, mariscos, vale, help me. Uh, like mussels, <laughs> mussels. Yeah. So oh, okay. the <laughs> habitat, of, the, habitat the, 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 the marine habitat of the Chungungo had a lot of pressures. And with the continental zone, we have a lot of pressures too. In South of Chile, we, we have, uh, uh, low pressure in continental zones, but uh, we have salmon farming uh, spent in all the fjords of Patagonia, uh, and they are making a lot of impact in this marine uh, habitat. And from, Puerto, from Los Rios to northern Chile, we have terrestrial uh, impact, the, the forestal, the tree industries, for, forest industries uh, are taking out all the water, the fresh water that others uh, need to, to survive. In the central zone of Chile, we have a, an, an uh, housing industry very, very, uh, have making a lot of pressure to the coastal zones. And, and, and we, are, we have these others uh, in close or pressures always in the intertide. So, when, he, when we have uh, some um, ah, marejadas, marejadas Idols. the ocean is yeah, yeah, when, when the ocean is uh, very hard, Chungungos doesn't have where to go. Uh, they need some uh, dry dents, and they don't have dry dents in Central Coast. So, and in the northern Chile, uh, we have uh, this uh, mining mining industry. Yeah. And they are putting now a lot of uh, pressure to make these um, uh, relaves submarinos. How do you call it, Vale? Can you help uh, me? I don't it's know that word. The water. How do you call it? It's a very technical word. I'm sorry. I don't know. Relaves mm, submarine. The, the, the leftovers of the mining, they, they want to, to live out in the, in the bottom of, of the sea. Uh, yeah. The, so um, and we have in all Chile the mine spot. <laughs> they are they are helping me by, by the chat, but and it's a, a very uh, big problem we have with Chungungo is the the, the dogs. Uh, at least in Central Zone we have two uh, two priorities: death, these dog predators with otters, and. Uh, uh, incidental bycatch on chungungos uh, in in artisanal nets. So helping government to achieve this uh, goal to preserve chungungo is very difficult in Chile. Um, 
in with our actual constitution it's very extractive uh, model so we have salmon farming forest industry housing and mining it's very difficult to fight uh, against them so but now in chile we are we are having a new constitutional process our first constitutional in democratic uh, time so we are all very um hope uh, so hopeful <laughs> that Hopefully, we yeah. can improve yeah that we can improve this this nature care in in our new path that it, that is coming ah brilliant um i think we've got time for a couple more questions so um somebody's asked how did you choose where to put the first tunnel and then that was kind of in the video how did you choose where to put that uh we choose the 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 harder part to to go <laughs> so <laughs> the dogs uh, <laughs> we have we have we have two, two problems one one were the dogs and and the second is the people there the person doesn't understand uh, all the efforts that we are doing and they vandalize vandalize that where they broke or stole our equipment uh, so we have uh, a lot of work to hide this and, and try to, to, to find uh, an inaccessible place. So we're trying to look the, the harder cliff to climb down <laughs> and that's where we, <laughs> where we put the dents. Perfect. That's a, that's a fair answer and a good answer. I've got maybe time for one more question. Um, uh, how how are Anne's asking how are the forest industries taking out all the fresh water and do they divert the fresh water somehow? Uh, that's uh, our hypothesis because uh, we recently discovered that Chungungos need fresh water. Uh, for a, two or three years ago, uh, everybody thought that Chungungo doesn't need fresh water. So uh, we are now trying to understand how they live, uh, especially in the North Chile and uh, with these forest industries that uh, take all the subsoil water, um, under soil water. Yeah. Um, so we, it's not only forest industries because uh, the, the, we have three regions without others in Chile and it's the same three regions where we have forest industries, forest industries in, in coastal zones. And that's it's not the only variable. We have long uh, sand uh, beaches, beach, beach. Yeah. Um, so Chungungo, has difficult to, to, to pass too many time in water. So they have to go to the sand and they have uh, probably uh, they, uh, prey by dogs or don't have a uh, shelter. The forest goat uh, goes uh, total into the coastal zone. So they, uh, they change the, the shelter, the nature shelters by bushes or some other uh, habitats. Chungungo doesn't live only in rocks. Uh, it makes burrows or dents in, in, in many, many ways. They, they, they choose uh, bushes, they choose sometimes uh, caves or rock, and we don't know how, 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 how much, but in those zones, uh, it may be change of the, of the bushes and the and the coastal habitat, and uh, it can be the, the, the fresh water too. But it's a, it's it's something that we have to to study. It's yeah. not a certain, you know. Perfect, um, Javi and Valentina. Thank you so much. I'm gonna pass over to our next speaker. Thank and, you for having us. Uh, no, my pleasure. Thank you for sharing your video with us. And um, if there's any other questions, I'll try and put to to use at the end. So. Uh, our next speaker is Adriana Vallejos, um, excuse my pronunciation, um, she's going to talk about neotropicals in auto, uh, neotropicals in Argentina and a bit about the climate crisis as well. So I'm just going to give a brief introduction to Adriana. So 
Hi, I'm Adriana Vallejos. Uh, she's 31 years old from Corrientes, a province in the northeast of Argentina. She's a park ranger and I've been working in conservation for the provincial government of Corrientes since 2011. Nowadays, she is working as a ranger detachment boss at San Cayetano Provincial Park and is doing field work as an aspiring bio, bio, biology sciences graduate in the study of neotropical otter for the National North East University of Biological Station from Corrientes um, Ecological Applied Littoral Centre. The species is protected by law as a nat natural monument of Corrientes and has not been investigated in the region in more than 15 years. So I'll pass over to Adriana for her presentation. Thanks, Adriana. Hi, everybody. Are you listening to me? Good. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, thank you, Ben, for your presentation. Let me share the screen. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Well, I'm going to introduce uh, to you uh, to this is my field work called the distribution of neotropical other Lobito de Rio and the climate crisis a study case in Argentina. So, well, as, as you know, as other authors, the Lobito de Rio is a semi-aquatic mystery and the distribution, the distribution is from Mexico to the center of Argentina and Uruguay. And in Argentina, there are in 11, 11 provinces from a total of 23 with a confirmed presence. Well, about the conservancy state, uh, globally, uh, the Lobito de Rio is near treatments by the IUCN Red List. Inside it is in the appendix one. Uh, in Argentina, it's near treatment two. Uh, by the red list of mammal of Argentina and in Corrientes province where this word takes in place is a uh, protect um, is declared as natural provincial monument. This is the uh, highest um, level of protection uh, for an animal um, in this province in law. Well, about uh, why uh, we decided to study Lobito de Rio here in Corrientes is because studies on these species are scarce in Argentina. And in Corrientes, there are only three studies on 1992, 1993, and 2003. So we did not have uh, um, information on the species almost in 20 or 15 years. Well, our, our main goal is to generate based ecological information of the neotropical other, the Lobito de Rio, in order to make better conservation and management decisions for the species. Our specific goal is to determine the presence and spatial distribution of the species along the Rio Trello River. Uh, the Rio Trello River is a tributary of the Parana River and to explore other habitat use in the Riachuelo, uh, that is the Riachuelo River Basin. Well, about um, the study site, uh, you know, this is Argentina, Corrientes, the Corrientes province is at the Northeast of Argentina. And the field site is located in the Northwestern of Corrientes. Um, the, um, this is the capital city of Corriente. This is the study uh, site. And we work along the Rio Chelito stream, which is this, and then to the Riachelo, the Riachelo River to up to the mouth of Parana River, which is here. Around uh, 25 kilometers from the Parana River uh, is the San Cayetano Provincial Park is a 80 hectares natural protected area where I worked since year 2015. Well, there are, uh, these are some images for the study site. Uh, this is the Riachuelo River. Uh, you look um, um, gallery in forest. 
and it have um, near the river there are some uh, wetlands or marshes like that. Well, about uh, how how we do the field work. Um, our selected route was divided into five kilometer sections where we traveled nine transects of uh, one kilometer parallel to the river. Uh, when we were two people traveled each transect and recorded uh, sites with signs of presence of the otters in cloudy pieces latrines, burrows, direct sightings, and footprints. Um, for transect data, we collect this information about type of vegetation, and we have a human influence category. And when we detect or when we, when we find a site or a sign, we collect this data. Eh? Where we did these measures about distance from the site sign to the water, percentage of vegetation cover, physical ground structure, dominant vegetation type, GPS point, and the ghost inclination. Well, these are some photos about the field work. Here I am with my colleague uh, as a park ranger uh, working in the Rio Chuelo. Here I'm uh, doing some uh, measures on the coast of the Riachuelo. Here I'm trying to, to be another and feel like another in the Riachuelo. Um, well, here are my the materials, that, uh, my work material for the field work. Um, uh, this is a part of my work, my lab work. You know, when, for example, when we collect pieces, um, we put it on them in, in ethanol uh, for uh, future researchers and for future uh, students uh, that, can, that they can uh, study parasites, other parasites. Well, here is a video about uh, Lobito de Rio in the Riachelo River. I hope you like it. Very short, but it's feeling um, when I, when it saw me, it go down on water. Well, about the results, um, 44 kilometers of the Riachello River travel from February to May of this year. We recorded uh, 23 points of neotropical other of uh, the de Rio presence two sightings, five pieces, 14 uh, footprints, one dead animal, dead body, and one school. Well, um, and now what are we going to do and what, what are the steps, uh, the steps to follow? To follow. Uh, we recorded uh, 19 other signs and we saw two others directly the other signs are indirectly. Um, well, as uh, Ben say, uh, this is my undergraduate project to obtain my degree on July 22. And um, well, I hope <laughs> to finish on term. And well, it will, it will include because uh, we are going to analyze now, yeah? We are all of these things on the data collection, it will be under analyzed then. So it will include relative abund abundance, habitat use, special distribution analysis, habitat preference, um, the uh, identification of conservation problems in these study sites. Well, we, during the field work, we identify different trees and a high degree of human pressure on other habitats. Uh, for example, we, uh, we saw poachers with dog. Here is a footprint, a neotropical other footprint with a shotgun bullet. For example, these are all shotgun bullets that I uh, collect uh, during the field work. You can see a lot of uh, dogs and with the uh, fishermen, there is a cut. Um, the problem are poachers 
don't uh, hunt or don't shoot directly others, uh, but the problems, as um, Javier say, is that the dogs that they can persecute the persecution of dogs to others. Um, well, another treat is the extremely drought on the February and the part of March. In Corriente, we have uh, lived a, a really extremely drought. And we can see a little uh, bit or a little amount of, of water, and this can affect other trees. Well, the garbage, uh, the garbage is, uh, we can see uh, about uh, uh, fisherman places. Um, for example, we see bottles, plastics, um, a lot of plastic in the coastline, uh, kilometers of garbage. Uh, another problem, another treat is the deforestation and habitat fragmentation. You can see it usually be a uh, gallery in forest, but now we have only one or two trees. The fire, well, in all these images, uh, I, I, I take uh, in during my field work, uh, for example, when we were doing the field work and a lot of smoke surrounded by smoke sometimes, especially in February and March, we, we, we find uh, places like this uh, that they are still burning when we are we were here. And sometimes we have to stop the field work to uh, in a battle with the fire and to, um, to turn off the fire. Uh, we saw rat killing, rat killing around the field work in some uh, woods around the field work and then this region. And well, some uh, after fire, some rocks we have floods. Uh, these are from April, and uh, in, the, in April uh, we have floods. So um, I think uh, I. I uh, these uh, images from the Rio Chile River, you, you can see that it, it, it have no cost. It's, uh, in fact, this is in the, in the park where I work, uh, you can see the floods. And uh, we have to stop uh, for logistic problems, the field working times. Um, I normally want to show this. Uh, we, we are not, uh, well, all this information is about, uh, uh, it will be under analysis. So, I think uh, uh, in, a, in a little short of time, we never have this change in a short period of time, in, of this time. So I think that um, this information and this data, it would be, it had a, a very good perspective for future research. So, well, as citizen science uh, in the project, we designed flyers to social media. We provided a contact and basic information for everybody to register lobby to the Rio, for instance. No? So this is a very good start point for lobby to the Rio and others in, 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 in this region of Argentina. And we have obtained 30 registers at, uh, at this. And well, we organized a collective mural with high school students and, and artists, and they paint together this mural of the, with Lobito de Rio team. Um, the high school selected for this activity is located near a natural project area with present of Lobito, uh, which is called uh, Laguna Brava. Well, I specifically, <laughs> I want to say to all these people who helped me in all this field work, uh, to, uh, they support me physically and emotionally, uh, to my directors, to uh, veterinaries and all the biological station members and artists who support this. Um, you know, I think uh, um, others, uh, it, it's difficult sometimes for park ranger um, it's hard to be a park ranger because we are all at the time seeing, uh, seeing things that affect the environment. We are always with, um, in a battle with fire, with blood, with deforestation. 
and lot of thin animals um, with uh, round over in the road killings, a lot of things. And sometimes it's so sad, uh, our work, and sometimes I think, uh, why I am doing this? But when I, when I see you and when, when I see all the work and all the presentations and, and people like you, people uh, that are interested on in others, I refresh my conviction, I refresh my hope. And I this uh, and I want to <laughs> it refreshes me to continue working. So I hope we we will have um, others for a long time. Um, well, especially thanks to Estación uh, Biológica Corrientes, all the members, to the International Other Survival Funds who um, gave me a, a grant uh, in the year 2021. And it, it won't be possible with um, this uh, help, the um, Dirección de Parques y Reserva, where I work, and Experiencia Corrientes, who uh, lend me the kayak to travel. Um, well, uh, really thanks to you, thanks to listen to me. Um, happy World Other Day for you. Thank you, Adriana. That was a fantastic presentation, and I thought it was really interesting to hear all the information you have, um, specifically in relation to climate change. Just to to emphasise to everybody, over the last six months, um, we've been talking. Um, probably six months ago, you were saying that the state was on fire and everywhere was in drought, and then about three months ago, I messaged you and you said everything was underwater. So it shows how quickly it's changed, and I think. I might be right in saying that, that this isn't normal. Is that correct? Yes, it's, it's like that. Uh, you know, um, it's like, as I say, we, we never had these changes in a very short period of time. So I think uh, this is information is very relevant for future study and, and to know how, uh, because uh, I think uh, in, in the state of, of dog, the, um, the La Vita de Rio is categorized as near treated or is declared uh, as a provincial monument in Corrientes. We saw a lot of trees. Uh, and so I think it's a very uh, good start point to Argentina for the La Vita in Corrientes. Yeah, definitely. It seems a good place to emphasize climate change, especially, and your work with otters will do that because of their importance in relation to the water itself. Does anybody have any questions for Adriana in relation to the work she's done or any of uh, Corrientes or the Neotropical Otter? No, I don't think there's any questions. You must have covered everything. Um, if there's any questions, you can pop it up over the next 20 minutes and we can ask Adriana at the end. Um, but if not, then I'll pass over to our final presenter, who is Ana Maria Montes Ferro. Um, Ana Maria works with giant otters in Brazil, um, I believe is based, based in Colombia. Um, so her, I'll give her a little bio before I pass over to her for her presentation in relation to that. So Ana Maria is a biologist and microbiologist based in Colombia. Meeting the Amazon rainforest through the eyes of otters allowed her to deeply understand an ecosystem shaped by water. Since 2015, her work in giant otters seeks to bridge her scientific formation with lo locals tacit knowledge to shape this unique ecosystem conservation. So Ana Maria, I will hand over to you. Thank you, I'm going to share the presentation. Should we sound? Okay. This stuff, perfect. Tuku, tuku, tuku. Yeah, that's perfect, we can see, see your screen. Okay, so happy Otter Day to all you all. Uh, my name is Ana Maria, I am a biologist and microbiologist. And uh, at the end of 2015, I co-created a conservation project uh, for the conservation of the giant otter and the neotropical otter in the Javari Basin. So just to locate us a little bit, I've been working in nature zoo Pavari and surrounding area. 
So this is the Amazon River. This is the Javari River. And the Javari sets the frontier between the Brazilian Amazon and the Peruvian Amazon. Uh, but really, this is what the Javari, the, what the Javari looks like. So today I decided to share with you uh, my journey as a younger biologist in the conservation of otters in the Amazon. And as Ben uh, introduced, uh, I, in a way I am very grateful that it was through the eyes of otters that I got to meet this unique uh, ecosystem. Because uh, as aquatic mammals, uh, giant otters live in the frontier between land and water. So they actually provide a great window to an ecosystem that has been deeply shaped uh, by water. And as uh, Joel Tapaduri, a fisherman from the community, once told me, um, here in the Amazon, roads are made of water. And I love these quotes but because it actually tells you a lot about the social dynamics um, in the Amazon rainforest. Um, so it is through water courses that human settlements first occur. occur, occur. So it is also uh, in this fresh water ecosystem that we'll start seeing the negative impact. Uh, we'll first see these impacts uh, uh, imposed by our species to the ecosystem. Um, and uh, as giant otters uh, and otters here uh, and humans both stand as top predators of this shared ecosystem, a conflict arises. Um, but here's the thing, uh, I strongly believe that when doing conservation and addressing these issues, uh, we need to start talking less about education and more about inclusion. And by inclusion, I mean the inclusion of other ways of knowledge in science, in research, in how we approach communities and how we work along, alongside uh, with them. So uh, here's the story, my story. Uh, when I first came to the Amazon forest for my first field trip, uh, I had done my research and I read the standardized guidelines for giant otter surveys. And what we we're going to do was count all individuals and photo ID in some of them. I'll explain later what it means. But after two weeks of no sites, not one site, uh, we said, okay, maybe we should go for a relative abundance survey. Uh, just count some individuals. But to be Completely honest, we had to set in identifying um, signs of otters present. So we, were, we started looking for dens, for footprints, uh, for campsite, and for latrines. Um, and, and we did find a footprint. This is the, fo the first footprint we ever find, and it was very exciting. So this is what we got. This is what the literature was telling us that we should expect. And um, we just, you know, we came back to this area. We were finding new areas of use. Uh, we, we set some cameras, we GPS located everything. And finally, we decided to use uh, this technique. So you use a liquid plaster and you can actually have a mold of the footprint uh, with a lot of details. Um, and then we don't have any more pictures because uh, what the mold made, uh, made very clear was that we had been following this guy. Uh, Melonoso Kuznigel, it's the black jacare, they can be huge actually. So it was, I think, like one month and a half later, we had just not one good result to show. Uh, but this, this story, this gator story, eventually got to the ears of the community. And they were having a, a good laugh at us, uh, and not only because of this gator story. And, um, and, and, and then, kids started coming to the station and, and they were telling us that they had seen the others. Um, so we traced back that information and here we were in front of fishermen, of, for, in front of woodcutters and, hunt, and hunters asking for help. And, um, and I met Diego and I met Raul and I met Guidico and I met so many of them. And, um, and this is when things started getting really interesting. Um, so <clears throat> they changed my approach. Um, I learned to listen. And, uh, and they start sharing me, with me all kind of stories, beautiful stories, and uh, teaching me a lot of things. So for example, they can tell whether on a cloudy day it's going to rain or not, because the toucan sings just before the rain falls. 
and they taught me uh, to differentiate the different smells of animals. Um, even snakes actually have a leave a particular an olfactory traits very particular, and um, and I would hear them uh, imitate all kinds of animals, you know, from all birds to monkeys to giant otters and neotropical otters. And actually, I saw animals respond uh, to your calls. <clears throat> and um, eventually, they trusted me enough, and they started sharing me the, the hard stories, uh, the, the sad ones. So back in the 70s and 80s, when the fur trade was a great source of income, um, well, they would kill otters, especially giant otters. And they explained to me that the challenge was <clears throat> how to kill an otter without damaging the fur. So what they did was that they would look for the dens, close the different entrance, and then they would use smoke. smoke. But with that story, you know, at that point, I, ha I had not seen my first den. So I was like curious about it. I said, like, what does the den look like? Where, where are those dens? And, and uh, he told me they are still there. And since then, giant otters are still using this, the, do the same, uh, same dens which was very surprising because we're talking that, I mean, it's been at least 30 years and I did not believe him, so he took me there. And uh, so this is the first den we ever encountered. And um, as you can see, we're really happy about it. And uh, with the help of the community, we actually finally managed to do, um, to count, you know, the others and do these population surveys, surveys. So I really like this picture because you know, how many others can we count? So you have one, two, three, four. And there's actually the fifth one right here. So not so easy to count. Still to this day, I find I found it. And then uh, I managed to photo, uh, photo ID some of them. So photo IDing uh, is uh, you take pictures of the ruler marks of the giant otters. And actually, each individual has a unique mark. So you can actually tell one individual from another. And uh, I managed to get four of them again, and the fifth one is still missing. Um, so yeah. So what became very clear to me with time was that it was not education that is lacking. It was not a problem of ignorance. It was really, I mean, their knowledge, their, the knowledge of their surrounding ecosystem is, is unique and is overwhelming, and, and uh, it has so much value. So for me, what I understood then was that the challenge was not to me teaching them to change their ways because of the ongoing conflict. It was how can we bridge their knowledge with our scientific methodology to actually make a change? <clears throat> so five years later, this is what I knew. Because of the high vegetation, the, uh, vegetation density in the Amazon, visual approaches to monitor giant otters very, are very limited. Um, Giant otters have an evasive behavior. Uh, it's an adaptation to the ongoing conflict between, between them and fishermen, which also reflects in a low population density. So if I, if I was spotted by an otter, they would just leave their territory behind and I'll have, I will be, you know, I had to start over my research. And so with what the community had taught me, this is what I thought. I have to use other senses than sight. I have to not be there and I have to not be seen. <laughs> and then um, from the literature, uh, there is actually a temporal bias in giant otter research. It's restricted to the dry season because as uh, Adrian, I think was explaining, the, the, the water level changes a lot from the dry season to the rainy season. It can be like eight meters, 10 meters. And so giant otter territory expands into the flooded forest. And uh, if you try to canoe through that forest, it's very hard. And it's even harder to actually get where the giants are. Um, so then, you know, I looked in the literature, like what methods were actually allowing for, you know, this greater temporal and spatial resolution, spatial, spatial. Anyway, and um, what I found is, I don't know, for example, telemetry that you follow uh, with, a, with a satellite, uh, giant orders. It actually was very expensive and it raised ethic issues. Um, you have to operate the animal and in two instances, uh, the animal died. So yeah, not really what I was looking for. 
So this was my conclusion. For giant authors monitoring, what we need is a cheaper, novel, non-invasive approach that could cover both the wet season and the dry season, and why not the day and the night? So the communities had taught me to read the jungle with my eyes closed. And I said, okay, let's do that. Let's start listening to the others. Let's study authors by capturing sound. Now I'm going to show you a video that I think uh, really portrays uh, the challenges of monitoring uh, giant otters in the Amazon. But before I do, I want to um, kind of put you into context. So you'll hear giant otters uh, and you'll hear these three types of, vocal of vocalization. The snort and the ha are like warning or threatening. And then the contact call is uh, like a whistle and they will leave afterwards. So this is what it sounds like. The snort, the contact call, and the ha. And then you'll see, you will hear Diego, he is from the community. And I believe he was kind of imitating a combination between these two giant otters uh, vocalizations. And this one. They are so, I, I think they're crazy. Um, and you'll see what, what happened was that Diego started doing this vocalization and then the otters came to us. Uh, wait, this is not so easy. I don't know. Wait. I'm having a problem. Changes. Oh my God. Next presentation. I'm sorry about this. No. Okay, please stop. Uh, so this is the, the video. That was the whistle, and this is when the others left. It's kind of let's move together and get away from here uh, type of vocalization. So as you can see, the others were really close. I heard them, but I could not see them. And this ha has happened to me so many times that it, ha it, it does make sense, uh, a lot of sense to actually study them by sound. And so, oh la la, excuse, uh, sorry. I don't know why it does this. So we carried the first field essay, uh, essay on giant otter passive acoustic monitoring. Uh, we set some recording units in the different areas of the giant otters territory, and we capture some uh, to study the otters. And so here's the thing, I had come to the Amazon thinking that out of ignorance, communities were driving otters to extinction. But after all these years, I understand that the one that was acting out of ignorance was, was me and that they possess a great knowledge of their surrounding, of their surrounding uh, uh, ecosystem. And we really need to include, be more inclusive, inclusive of these other kinds of knowledge. And, uh, and the funny thing in all of this is that I had come with my IUCN uh, guidelines, having to spot the others. And five years later, and it took me five years to just actually start listening. So that, that's the story. Thank you. Thank you, Anna Maria. That was fascinating. And I, I love the way you kind of involved the communities. And you started off perfectly when you said education is about inclusion. I think from your story perfectly sums up that they actually have way more knowledge than we do. So it's more important to actually use and utilize their knowledge than utilize our own knowledge. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions for Anna Maria and her, her really interesting story about her community work? Um, Anne's asked if um, the communities still hot hunt otters for income or to protect their fishing. No, the, the hunting has stopped and it's really, uh, you cannot do that. You, you'll, you'll be in legal trouble. So that has stopped. Uh, but the conflict for the fishing resort, 
for the fishing resource is there. The fishing resource has gone down uh, in a very worrisome way uh, during the wet season. You know when uh, uh, there's like the water levels go up, fish is a little, is uh, less dense, so it's yeah. hard to fish. And in in one winter, I actually uh, started hearing lots of gunshots in the night because fishing was no longer an option to for protein, which is crazy because in the Amazon it's like the fish usually they jump in your boat. So the conflict is there. It's not actually between the local communities. It's actually people coming come from the big cities, from the from Peru, from Brazil, and from Colombia. So it's kind of complicated in this frontier area. Okay, that, that's interesting. Uh, Heidi Davis is asking, um, how many different otter sounds could you record and differentiate? Um, so, was there more? Uh, I love that question. Giant otters are actually the most uh, complex species uh, in regards to vocalization. Um, and you have actually uh, the like the author specialist uh, decided that there are actually 16 different call types, but some of them are really hard to differentiate. And some um, author special giant author specialists are suggesting that cubs also have uh, specific voca vocalizations that we should account. So 16. That's it. Um, William Ngomo, who was actually a speaker last year, is doing a lot of work in Tanzania and Africa. He's asking um, what measures are used to protect otters and is there law to protect them as well? So you are in an area from between two, two countries, yes? Yeah. So if a Peruvian guy does something or a Brazilian guy or a Colombian guy does something, it's very hard to know which law is going to act. And actually, the government is really absent in these uh, areas. We are like far away inside of this pristine forest. So no, the, the really is, uh, I mean, the legal protection exists, but it's not really applied. Yeah, that makes sense, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, I'll just see if there's any more questions for you. Um, so in terms of that area, it obviously covers three different countries is there differences in terms of like the communities between the three countries do they vary or are all the communities engaged with kind of the work you do each community is different yeah. um, so what uh, in the brazilian side you have to speak portuguese and that that's a difference that's already a big difference like the language some of them yeah. some of them are spanish some of them are indigenous some of them are uh, uh, descendant of the rubber people, the one that used to extract rubber. So they yes. uh, so the story is very different from community to community, even if they are like 30 minutes away from each other. Uh, really? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Grace Yoxon of IOSF, actually, she said that she loved your presentation um, and the sounds are so different, but also so similar at the same time as the Eurasian otter we have in Scotland. Yeah. I love to hear them. It is very unique. Yeah, it is, yeah. I find it really interesting when you said, um, not necessarily in relation to otters, but you said that the communities know it's going to rain because the two can start singing. Yeah. That's so amazing. because, you know, I, I went with them so many times and I was like, oh my God, it's going to rain, we have to go. And they were like very calm about it. So one day I asked him like, how do you know? Like, how do you really know? And he said like, you have to listen to the Tucan. And then I start noticing the Tucan, if he if the Tucan sings, yes, it's going to rain. If it was he doesn't, it's, it's not. And there are other birds that they also use as cues yeah. as to how the environment is going to change. That's amazing. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um I'm people might have more questions. Um, I'm just gonna ask some to everybody because there's quite a few oh wait we have a question already for you so um kiwi has asked uh, do you think it's possible to identify individuals from their vocalizations in the future um maybe but you need a a very good quality sound recording i think yeah uh, so the quality of the audio it, it becomes more expensive then yeah and and anyway if Anyone ever wants to come to the nature reserve for Marie, they, they actually accept tourists. 
And if you actually want to get involved in any way in this project, just write to me. I am very friendly and we are welcoming all the help you can get. Thank you. That's very nice of you. Very nice. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm just going to have a look at some through some of the questions I think I might have missed um, to other sort of speakers. So there's a question, uh, and apologies to Heidi for missing this question earlier on, is to Javier. Um, she's asking you kind of how the movie and your work is received and appreciated by um, locals in your area, uh, by the Chileans that you live alongside. Um, do you have local supporters and how do you raise funds? Um, I'm back. Um, uh, it's uh, our work is very new in Chile. Uh, remind that only three others are being uh, getting back to the nature. So this work is recently uh, starting to, to be shared. Uh, with other parts and yes uh, it is well received uh, by authorities by others rescue centers and uh and scientific too uh, we don't have any support uh, for governments we have uh, uh only um support from nature uh yeah per nature persons yeah like Natural people, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they, they support with a uh, with a uh, uh, month 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 fee, um, and we we recently uh, start uh, to work with uh, AIDS to Animal Foundation, and uh, with uh, this support we are developing, designing, and uh, constructing. Uh, the first uh, rehabilitation center for otters. We have this new otter for four month old, three or four month old. So we are um, trying to build uh, two types of pools. One like uh, sea otter aquariums, not for people see, but uh, we have a to have a, a pool with uh, with some species that they eat, so he can practice and uh, other pool uh, to recreate and develop their abilities that they have to to learn um, to 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 have a good well in in the nature so it is well appreciated a lot of uh, a lot of persons uh, care about otters uh, so uh, a lot of people uh, call us or reach us to to take care about special dents so we are trying to 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 get this uh, this energy <laughs> uh, and we are making this new program uh, to 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 bring citizens to science and uh, we are trying to make this regional monitoring of others about uh, 200 kilometers of uh, rocky zones uh, to know what is happening with otters uh, in this Valparaiso region. So this is the last region uh, that we have a good population of otters and to the south uh, it's not very frequent to, to, to see it. So we are trying to secure this uh, population to uh, re-ottering, as, as the name of the of the film, yeah, re-ottering uh, the southern regions for Palaiso. So um, we are trying to 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 make this this uh, citizens participatory uh, in this monitoring, and we think that that could be a, a founding resource uh, too. Uh, we're we're trying to to make this ambassadors in every rocky points to to secure populations perfect thanks for your answer to that um there's a question for it's a general question from Anne. i think heather's probably best suited to add to this but um it says general question do all otters living in marine environments require fresh water to keep their fur in suitable condition um, I know, speaking on the Eurasian orders that we have here in Scotland or in the UK, that they do need fresh water. Um, obviously, the water, and maybe not just the water, but Scotland's very cold. Um, so 
they need to keep their fair and pristine condition to keep warm. Um, as ja Javi mentioned, um, for the marine otters, it's only realised in recent years. Um, but getting to the question is, um, do sea otters require fresh water or are they the only fully adapted marine species of otter living without fresh water? I'm definitely going to let Javier speak specifically to the marine otter, but for sea otters, um, they do not require fresh water. They're able to live their entire life in the marine environment um, and they do not need access to fresh water. So just to kind of follow on from that question, um, the, the otters that you're watching today often, I know I've seen pictures of them obviously on land, but do they very rarely come out onto land? That's a great question. And it's something that I think in the last decade has really become very much more aware for general public. So at the very beginning, as sea otter um, populations were really increasing through California, there was this general consensus that they never come on land. Um, and what we understand now is that that's not true. Um, so sea otters are capable of living their entire life without having to come on land. However, it benefits them to do so. So remember, I talked about energetic cost and how expensive it is for them to remain in such cold water for so long, that being able to come out on land and haul out either on small beaches, on the rocks, or even what's even more important is those estuaries with the pickleweed um, are really great resources for them to recoup. But it's been, it takes us having to choose certain areas where people aren't able to access. And California is a very busy place. <laughs> that we have, our coastlines are, you know, it's, it's, this overlap between these sort of urban otters and people. And so where we're able to see those haul out sites are in the areas where people don't get access. And so that's um, kind of been, as we can get more of those spots, it benefits the sea otters definitely. Yeah, that makes sense. And um, the same for the marine otter in Chile, Javi, that um, it's obviously quite a oh. recent finding. Uh, th this is really new information. So we don't know if uh, every otter in, in, in all their range, they need, um, fresh water. We are asking how they collect fresh water in the middle of the most desert, uh, most dry desert in, in the world. So yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, it, uh, it's, it's a very hard question to, to solve. But uh, as that we, we only uh, have seen otters uh, drinking fresh water, not using to keep their fair, uh, their fair and suitable conditions. Um, it seems that they don't need fresh water to keep the, the, the condition of the fur. And um, well, here in Chile, uh, I was trying to, to, to open the mind, maybe this, uh, we call it Bawada Costera, it's like the, this cloud of sea reach the, the, the continent and, and maybe that fresh water can be drinked uh, that when, when, when it condensed in rock. We are trying to develop to, to, to understand uh, an, another thing that's uh, we don't know if it's if, if it's a, a, a behavior that they learn in captivity, but but it is all the, the otters that we receive of the northern uh, regions of Chile, they lick their tail and the center and, and south they don't. So maybe with the tail they can put this fair tail and, 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 uh, can, and help to collect fresh water. There are a lot of uh, what <laughs> that we don't know, but um, I hope that uh, in future years in Chile, there's um, more and more scientists uh, to take care about others. Um, so there are a lot of questions that we have to, to, to solve from now on. <laughs> and yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks for that. Um, we have a question maybe for Adriana. Um, there are people are asking, or a certain individual is asking if the Lobito studio or Neotropical Otter has been a victim of kind of illegal wildlife trade, perhaps in your area. Well, uh, Lobito de Rio here uh, it have not these problems. There is no mascotins or illegal wildlife trade. Um, in the past, uh, about uh, 30 years ago, the problems of conservation uh, of Lobito de Rio here in Corrientes, it was the fair trade uh, about the skin. But um, then in, when the uh, uh, Ibera wetlands, a, a very big uh, um, reserve uh, and of 1 million hectares was created in this period. And 
um, it all uh, think, uh, things have changed uh, for good for others, but uh, it's a problem in, of the past. There is no uh, demand of, of fur uh, now. So uh, we have uh, not, it's not a conservation club at the mascotine or the legal wildlife trade at this moment. Yeah, thank you for that. And um, just kind of to further on that, um, in regards to the neotropical otter or Levita studio, and um, I know in other parts of their range, they have been um, taken as pets, kind of pet, young otters as pets. Um, that's also the same for giant otters we found. Um, obviously, in regards to the pet trade, there's more of a focus on the Asian species, but it is and ha as has been happening in kind of South America and Central America as well, with um, both the species, the giant otter and the neotropical otter. Uh, question. Um, I'll open this up to, this is an, uh, an anonymous attendee, so there's no name I can give it to, um, but in general, what are your thoughts on visiting aquariums or zoos to observe otters? Is anyone if anyone wants to take that on, if has any sort of passionate thought about that. I'm happy to mention just from a sea otter perspective. Yeah, um, go ahead. So I know that there's at least for the areas, the aquariums that do host sea otters here in the United States, these are for nonprofit um, aquariums. They are not for profit. Um, so I can't speak to smaller um, wildlife viewing sort of stations like that but with the monterey bay aquarium it is revolutionized how sea otter research is conducted um and they have a surrogacy program so all of any pups that come in that need to be rehabilitated are rehabil rehabilitated using um females that are in-house that cannot be um released due to injuries or human contact and stuff like that so these pups are reared and then re-released without any human contact and it's been an incredible um, aspect of how reintroduction could occur. So I do find that the aquariums in that sense have been a huge player in this for the research side, as well as the recovery for the species. Perfect. Thanks, Heather. Um, Claire, I think you've got your hand. Obviously, you're, you're working in an aquarium, so you'll have a good side to that too. Yeah, I kind of feel like I should say something. <laughs> <laughs> Potentially. Um, I actually just wanted to challenge other because we've managed to, um, there's obviously a big push for not having mammals. Sorry, let me just sort my house out. For not having mammals in captivity nowadays. Um, and we've managed to, just thinking outside of the box, we have seals on display that are wild seals because we in the, obviously we're in an area that we can do that but we've got seals that are on display next to the aquarium that are completely wild, but allows us to do education around them. And now with our otter situation, it's a challenge to do an, an, an otter display that's completely in the aquarium, but the otters are wild and um, are able to come and go at will. So there are other ways to do it. And just from an aquarium point of view, obviously um, in terms of like what Monterey Bay does, um, yeah, I've been lucky enough to visit them twice and have very good colleagues there. Um, yeah, there's a huge space for keeping species alive and learning about how to, well, the husbandry of them within aquariums um, in case things really do, do go even more pear-shaped um, in the wild. So as long as your aquarium is doing education, correct education around that, I think there's definitely a place for that. Yeah, thanks for your answer, Claire. Um, Javier, do you have something to say on that as well? Yeah, um, uh, I'm particularly, I'm not um, a supporter to have otters in zoos or aquariums. I think at least Chungungo needs a lot of uh, range habitat. They're moved like two kilometers or four kilometers just in one day. So, um, and uh, I have in, in, in rehabilitation process, we had uh, otters in captivity and, and, and we can observe a lot of stress patterns um and uh, as heather uh, said it's it's very useful to have otters that can uh, can't uh, get back to nature to have uh for for help this reputation but i think it's 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 more um educational to to show otters in their nature than uh, in zoos i i, I know at least 
Chungung is very difficult to see. They spend only four or five hours on the sea and half of that time they spend uh, during the night. So um, it's very difficult, but uh, I think that that we as a, as a human species, we have to, to, to understand that, that we have to, to help uh, otters uh, as Monterey Aquarium do. Uh, I really um, appreciate the work. I, I've been there twice and I learned a lot. Um, but I think that, that we have a lot of work to do to, to put the environmental uh, observation on, on value. And it's not that easy to, 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 to see others. And I think that that uh, special things, it has something to, to, to love about them. You know, it's, it's not a, an animal that, that you can see it happy in captivity or at least chungungos. Uh, it's very difficult to to have in small uh, spaces. So I think that we have. Uh, I know that aquariums and zoos uh, make a lot of uh, work for preservation and conservation. But I think we have to translate um, to to this nature observation in their own spaces. That's yeah. what I can. <laughs> Thanks, you're absolutely happy. Um, Adriana. I think you have a. We have your hand up anyway. Yes, well, about zoos, uh, uh, here in Corrientes, the zoo uh, has uh, disappeared and it converts in a conservation, conservation center called Aguara for the rehabilitations of others. So I don't know really how uh, it can uh, work here because we don't have zoos and we don't have this experience. So I really know. Sometimes I think that I'd be afraid <laughs> sometimes of. Um, other um, tropical other became uh, uh, as mascot Um So uh, I think uh, uh, we have no experience with that. In the um, Conservancy uh, Center, it's called Agora, which is in Corrientes, they do rehabilitation and they, 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 re they introduce again to a natural place. But for example, we, we don't know what happened with this other because um, the, the monitoring equipment is very expensive. So we don't know what happened with those. So we, we don't know if the, the return uh, is success, has success. But uh, this is my opinion about uh, this observation. Sometimes I'm very afraid of uh, wake up people to make this marketing. Yeah, thanks Adriana. Um, the final question, and I think it's a good question to end on, seeing as it's the last question too, is um, why, where did your love of otters come from? Um, I don't know who wants Adriana, do you want to answer that first? Is your camera still yes. on? Yes, well, my love about otters, I think is is a starting, is a, a now. Um, um, I think uh, I, because in Corinthians, nobody study uh, uh, otters I'm in the region. So I I starting to ask, or, why not? It's a very uh, opportunity for me and for my professional career. So uh, I'm, I'm just starting to be a, a utter crazy now, uh, but that is why uh, it is part of my interest because I love uh, the river. I love uh, the provincial park where I live. And uh, I think if we protect uh, the tropical other, the Lobito Rio, we can protect all uh, our uh, water. So. That's, I, I love them and, and more and more and more day to day. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Anna Maria, you want to answer? Uh, for me, as a biologist, I always had a thing for uh, social species. I think they're uh, very interesting. And then uh, I got to meet uh, their habitat and just kind of into the forest, for, through the forest. Uh, I just fell in love with their habitat, with them. and. Uh, at the time, they, there was not a lot of research on giant otters, so it also felt like I was going to discover that, like, uh, you know, that like the path was uh, there was a long way to, you know, to study these animals. As I don't know, as chimpanzees or, or, or monkeys. So yeah, that would be brilliant. Thanks, uh, Heather. 
Yeah, well, I love that question. Um, I actually started, my love of otters came from the, the river otter. <laughs> I grew up and started to watch the, the river otters start to rebound in, in the Bay Area, which was really exciting. And so when I went to um, school and was offered the opportunity to do work with sea otters, that sort of paved the way for me and the fact that where I grew up, there aren't sea otters. Um, but there should be. And so that kind of really emphasized why this research and that um, interest for me has been so strong. Oh, yeah, thanks. Uh, Javier? Yeah, thanks. Um, my love for others, it's, it, it's uh, my work uh, in coastal zones, it doesn't start with others. It was very, I, I, I came to this area about this Sula Variegata, like a bird, a colonial breeding site. And um, I work with otters in Chinchimen, but not directly. And uh, when I was the, as a chairman of president of Chinchimen, it's, it arrived Changuita. No, it's Changuita was yes. rescued and nobody had um, any infrastructure and we, we, we doesn't have either. So <laughs> we have this transport cage, like very little. And, and that experience uh, to take care of, uh, to take care 24 seven with all the care and all the, um, the, the help that, that I have with the local person and scientist and veterinary. So I think that, that marks to me this, the, my love for others and my commitment to, to work for the protection of these species. That was, um, well, I think that everybody who works so near with others, it's, uh, <laughs> it's realized how, how much, uh, how charismatic they are. So um, I like it that you can answer that question too, Ben, <laughs> as you're the international author. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, for, for me, um, <laughs> uh, I'm kind of the same as you, Javi. I've uh, been involved. Um, my parents, obviously, I've started the charity, uh, what was it, 28 years ago, 29 years ago, and I'm 32. So ever since I was born pretty much I've been helping them with the rehab or the research work so uh, it's just a, a passion that's kind of built through the years and just like you say they're so charismatic watching them they're so playful there's there's a lot to like about them um Claire I know your your otter work is is maybe younger than some other speakers but you've obviously got a passion as well so where, where did that passion come from um, yeah, I think that's actually quite a tough question. I've been <laughs> sitting here thinking about that. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, they're, yeah, they're highly, highly complicated little creatures. Um, but I think what gets me is just the trust, actually. They seem to, especially our otters, our Cape Clawless, seem to, from my experience when I was younger as well, um, being able to scuba dive with them and coming right up to my face. And they seem to have quite an inherent trust for humans, which is a bit silly. Um, and I think that's what's, yeah, really sparked my interest in them. Um, and I mean, there's not, there's not, once you spend time with them, there's not much not to love about them, really. Yeah, absolutely. And um, last, but by no means least, Valentina. Hi, I don't know why I can't put my video, but I can answer the question, definitely. Yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> uh, so mine, I think, as I'm not coming from a scientist background, it was like, um, like a journey. I think in the beginning, I've, I've always been passionate about wildlife. Uh, where I'm from in the south of Chile, we have chungungos and I've, I, I saw them a few times, uh, but I was kind of disconnected from them from uh, like, besides the other wildlife that I was pretty much connected. And um, by knowing Javier and knowing the, the, the work that he was doing and, and doing some research and getting to understand them more a bit and like getting to sit there and look at them for hours. I think that's when like the actual, because I always liked them, but then I got to like, really really fell in love with this animal and, and starting to like understand the behaviors and, and and literally sitting on rocks watching them all day for weeks to film this film as well and so it was it was like a I, I kind of fell in love with them by watching them and like kind of understanding that they were really really complicated creatures and very funny and and yeah like I just I just fell in love with them as well in the process and now I'm on I'm an utter lover yeah absolutely <laughs> no, nothing inspires like watching yeah they're so funny and, I, and playful sorry i just wanted sorry, to add man. that i think it's it happens especially for people that is not uh connected necessarily with the scientific 
uh, side, it's like you fell in love with things that you get to know. And that's why I yeah. think everyone does like co like conservation and like education specifically. And as a filmmaker also like films about these things. So people get, get to know these animals and fell in love with them as well. And, and that's why I think we all also are in the same page with that um, to get to make them known to be conserved, basically. Absolutely. Good, good. A perfect way to finish and a great, great last question to finish on as well. So um, after all these amazing presentations, um, myself um, at IOSF, I just want to say thank you to Claire, Valentina, Heather, Anna Maria, Javier and Adriana for their brilliant presentations, sharing their passion and also to all of you attendees that have taken the time out of your day to come and share and enjoy World Daughter Day with us together. So thank you so much um, again to all the speakers. Thank you so much to all the attendees and enjoy the rest of your World Daughter Day wherever you may be. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um,